everyone. I am so glad you are here with us today. Thank you for choosing to join us for Digital Church at Stevens Road Baptist. I am Pastor Aaron, and why don't you take a moment just to say hello in the comments to let us know you are with us today, and uh, yeah, to say that hello, and feel free at any time to comment in the chat as we go along. Um, if you are with us Sunday at 10.15, then you're probably watching Premiere on Facebook. And we do have some a little uh, tweaks and differences of our service. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. So the first thing is, is that we've decided that our Premiere is going to be on Facebook. And so if you really like that engagement and seeing the comments and chatting with people as we get the service going, then Facebook is the place for you and it will be premiered at 1015 so you can have that live chat along with it. If you're someone who kind of is okay without the comments, um, maybe you watch the service anytime or you still want to be at 1015, then on YouTube, we are going to post the service on Sunday mornings at 7, and it's just going to be there kind of on demand that you can go and watch it at any time. Now, something else you might notice that is going to be different about our digital church services is that we're not really going to have our explorer's moment that we've had in the past where I come on, give the welcome, we do the explorer's announcements, prayer, and um, sermon, continue on. We're doing something different, a little new, and we are blending together our kids' night out and our explorers together to create Stevens Road Kids Church online. And so, how you can watch that. So kids, if you're there watching too, and parents, this is for you if you have kids or grandkids, know someone with kids that you want to recommend it, then after Pastor Christopher does the sermon, then we're going to have a couple announcements across the slide and a countdown is going to start for Stevens Road Kids Church online. And that's where we're going to have a time. I will be there, and I'll have some other friends there. So it's going to be kind of like the videos that we've done for the last little bit um, for Kids Night Out, but they're just going to be during Digital Church. Now, if you miss it during Digital Church, don't worry. It will be available on Sunday mornings on YouTube, just like the service will. And so you can go catch it there at any time during the week. And what I'm also excited about is that there will be an activity pack for you that you can download and you can print. Or if you don't have access to a printer, let me know and I can print it for you and it will be available for you to come pick up at the church. And also, there is a parent guide. So if you want to take it a, a step further and help your kids to grow in their faith and their walk with Jesus, then there is activities and games and questions that you can do with your kids anytime during the week. Maybe you want to take some time Sunday afternoon or another time um, for that. Once they watch the video, you can do uh, follow this parent guide along with it. So that's something that I think is exciting, and we're just trying to help you at home to be able to help your kids grow um, in their faith in Jesus. And so uh, our services is going to be this. I'm going to come on and welcome, do some announcements. Pastor Christopher will come. Um, and then right afterwards, we'll have our kids church that the kids can come and join. So we hope that um, you'll be able to engage that way as a family. And uh, whether you watch it all together or the kids watch it, um, we're just excited to be able to offer this for you. Now with that, for in-person church, we have started in-person church um, as long as guidelines for COVID-19 stay as they are. And so right now we're allowed to have faith gatherings, so that is happening. Um, there are no other gatherings as per se at the church, so youth group is still online and Bible study for Tuesday morning is still online. And uh, any other groups that are happening, you can get in touch with the people who lead that about what's happening for, for that. Um, we will let you know 
uh, when things change and when we can have more things back at the church. So youth group will be online and uh, will be on YouTube and then we'll be going to Zoom and playing a little Among Us. And um, so yeah, that's what things are looking like for now. Also, with being back in person, and I will be on the uh, live chat for the Kids Church, we won't be having um, Chit Chat Zoom today, um, this week, And but if there's someone who has been part of the our Chit Chat Zoom and would like to carry that on, then please let me know and we can um, talk about that and uh, get you on there. Also, one other quick thing, we're just trying out a new email service. And so if you've been getting our weekly service emails and our weekly emails for um, to <coughs> register for in-person church and you haven't seen that in your inbox, you can get in touch with me and I will help you through that process. Um, you should have gotten two this past week, one for in-person church and one for the church service. And so um, maybe you haven't gotten them, you just want to sign up. Um, but please check your spam and any other folders in there. You can search for Pastor Aaron at stevensroadbaptist.ca if you have the option in your email to see if you can find it, and we'll um, help you with that. Um, other than that, I think that's all for now, and uh, we'll take a moment to pray, and then Pastor Christopher will uh, bring our message for today. Dear God, we thank you uh, that we can gather together, and we thank you um, that we can uh, just come into your presence. We thank you for your presence. We ask that you would guide us today, that you would draw us closer to you because of um, the service today and for the kids that um, they'd really be able to engage in kids church and um, that we just be able to um, hear from you today, Lord. We just ask that you'd be with those who um, are not able to, <laughs> excuse me, to tune in and um, that <laughs> you would be with them, be with those who are sick and uh, may your um, encouragement and healing be sent their way. And God, we just um, ask that you'd be with um, all of us who interact online. It's been disheartening to see so many negative comments with, uh, in so many ways, um, whether it's just from a regular post or to what's been happening with our neighbors in the States. Um, even comments in the daily or the updates around COVID-19 um, may you help us to encourage kindness um, in others and um, just I pray for um, compassion and empathy as we interact with one another online and may we think about how what we put online can affect others and um, the impact that it has on people. And um, I just ask that you would uh, go with us this week, that you would help us to show your love and be a witness to you. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, it is so glad, uh, good to have you with us today. Uh, I guess I'll say Happy New Year again. It, it, it was one of those things that I was thinking about the other day that I, I, I don't know how far into January we get before we can stop stop greeting each other with Happy New Year. I'm going to say this one. This is my last one. When you, when you see me next week, uh, you are going to have to carry on without another Happy New Year greeting. Uh, I, I want you to think back to a little more than a year ago. So just as we were, were leaving uh, December 2019 behind and we were entering in to January 
2020. I want you to think back to what you were thinking and feeling at the time. What, what were your expectations? What were your hopes? Uh, what did you think 2020 would ultimately look like? I don't know what you were hoping it would be, but I bet it ended up being different. I know for me in 2020, I mean, I began the year with a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, you know, speaking about here, uh, I started the year with a new sermon series based uh, or titled around a pun. And I was super excited to begin this new preaching series, uh, Hindsight, because hindsight is 2020. And, and that made me laugh every time I looked at it. I was super excited to begin the year. In fact, uh, again, just talking about here, as we were exiting 2019 into 2020, uh, there was some momentum that we were excited about with ministry. There were more kids and teens around, and we were, we were trying to figure out how to, how to work on that and how to develop that. Our, our, some of our small groups and, and our conversations in them were, were going really well. And again, it was about how do we, how do we develop, how do we grow. Speaking, speaking personally, uh, our family, I mean, we were beginning to think of, of trips that we wanted to take. It, it had been a couple of years since we had seen some family out in Calgary, and we, we thought, oh, hey, this, this summer, July 2020, is going to be the time where we, we get to do that again. And we began planning enthusiastically. In fact, I was so excited because I just sort of uh, began running in uh, the latter part of 2019 that we, uh, we booked... Uh, we booked to participate in the Blue Nose in May of 2020. And we did that because we wanted to get our, our Nova Scotia Blue Nose shirts. And then when we went to Calgary in, in July of 2020 and participated in the Stampede race, we could, we could wear our, our Nova Scotia shirts with pride uh, at, on, this, on this Calgary race. In, in February and March... Uh, it's, it's when my kids, all their birthdays are either at the end of February or the beginning of March. And we were, we were excitedly celebrating, uh, we were excitingly celebrating their, their birthday parties. And we were beginning, of course, to hear uh, rumors and concerns. And we were beginning to see things uh, kind of a, a bit away from Canada about, uh, about the coronavirus. Um, but we have, I have pictures of, of my kids' birthday parties, of of a dozen or so people uh, being over in our house for each of them, you know, reaching into the same bowls of chips, you know, drinking from cups and then forgetting whose cup was whose and, and going, well, I'm pretty sure this was mine, I, I go, even though we're all drinking the same thing. Yeah, this one was probably mine and, and decorating cupcakes together. Uh, Ariella's birthday uh, was uh, the Saturday before the Saturday where everything really started uh, shutting down and closing down. And after that, after that moment, everything changed. And the entire year went differently than I had hoped or I had imagined. I gu my guess is you would tell a similar story. You, you entered 2020 with a, a series of expectations and hopes and goals. There were things that you wanted to accomplish and you wanted to do. There were, there were, there were new tasks that you were going to take on, new, new skills you were going to learn. Uh, 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 you, you had resolutions or goals that you wanted to, to achieve. And, and maybe you began the year really successfully, maybe statistically, like, like most of us, uh, by the time you meet mid-February, whatever the, whatever the goals or resolutions that you set in, uh, in February or in, in January began to get a little shaky. But whatever it was, my guess is you entered the year reasonably hopeful, reasonably enthusiastic, hoping for a better year than the year you had before, and then by about the middle of March, things began to change dramatically. And you began to realize that your tentative plans were going to come apart. Now here we are at the start of 2021. And perhaps you're being cautiously optimistic for what this year is going to bring. You're, you're hoping and you're hopeful that as winter gives way to spring and spring gives way to summer and summer gives way to fall, that this year 
has got to be better than next year. I mean, it's just has to be right. And I'm, I am right there with you. You know, we are, you know, we are, we are tentatively beginning to put on our calendar some of our best case scenario hopes for the fall and for the summer. We're, we're beginning to dare to allow ourselves to, to dream a little bit. But, and not to be a, not to be a downer, but what if, what if this isn't the year either? What if despite all of our best efforts, despite of all of our hopes, despite of all of our dreams, what if this isn't the year either? You know what I mean, right? That, that mythical this year where you finally get to do some of the things that you're hoping to do, uh, the year you finally retire, uh, the year the house is finally paid off, the year school finally clicks, the year your romantic relationship dreams finally come true, the year you can finally take the trip you've always wanted, the year uh, work finally takes you seriously, the year your health goals finally become a reality. And on and on and on I can go. I mean, every year, when we turn the, the page of the calendar over, when we, when we move from, from December to January, I think all of us step across that threshold and hope that maybe this is the year where it finally clicks, where it finally comes together. But what if it's not? Now, not to be a downer, but if it's not going to be this year, what do we do instead? And that's what I actually want to talk about for the next five weeks, uh, the, this week and, and four more, as we, as we talk about what if this year isn't the year either. And the first thing I want to talk about today is as we're entering into this period of, of cautious optimism for the year ahead, as we begin to wonder what this year may be, as we, as we begin to grapple with the fact that maybe this year isn't the year, the first lesson that I think is important for us to know is that Jesus has not abandoned us. Before I finally, before I get into the, into the, into the weeds with this, before we go through some of the, the passage that I want to look at, I do want to, I want to say something right up front. The idea that when life gets hard, or when things don't work out the way you want them to, that God has abandoned us, or that Christ has abandoned us, is very much a Canadian, an American, a European kind of way of looking at, at their understanding of God. And to be even a little more specific than that, it's, it's kind of a white Canadian, white American, white European way of looking at that. And, and I say that because our experience or, or, that, or that thought is not common across cultures or over time. It, it's because our lives have been relatively, relatively speaking, comparative to the rest of the world, fairly peaceful, stable, and prosperous. Not everyone individually. Maybe not you and maybe not me at all points in time of our life, but generally speaking, if you are a white Canadian or American or European, your life has been fairly peaceful, stable, and prosperous. So whenever things go wrong from that, we begin to wonder, why has God abandoned us? Why is life getting a little harder or a little trickier. Like, why, why aren't things working out the way I thought they would? But other cultures around the world, across time and space, or across time and space, I'm talking sci-fi, across, across time and cultures, that's not the way they view God. It, it, it can't be. It, it wouldn't survive their lived experience. It, it, it certainly isn't true for the first century followers of Jesus because if things had to go well for them, if it had to go easy for them, if God had to protect them from all, from all hurts and bumps and scrapes and, and hardships, then the, the gospel never would have left the first century. 
It, it never would have escaped Jerusalem because as soon as some of the religious leaders of the day began to put, to, to put real pressure on the apostles, they, they, if, if, if they reacted the way that we do, that, that when life gets hard, we, we must be doing something wrong, we, we must, uh, God must not be with us, um, if, if they reacted that same way, I don't think you and I would be talking about Jesus. But thankfully, that's not the way they perceived it. And it's not the way that, that countless centuries and generations of Christians had perceived it before them. But it is the way that some of us perceive it. That when life gets difficult, we begin to wonder if God is with us. And there is, in some sense, uh, a real natural inclination to do that. And, and that's what, again, this is what we want to talk about today. And, and to do so, I want to talk about uh, a really important figure, John the Baptist, just to think, uh, to help you know what I mean. Let's kick off. We're going to look at a few verses. We're going to read Luke 7. And I'm going to read you the first few verses of this. This is what Luke is telling us about John. I'm going to read these verses, and then I'm going to, then I'm going to give you some backstory, and I'm going to explain it a little bit. John's disciples told him these things. Or, uh, yeah, John's disciples told them these things. Uh, calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord and asked, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us here to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? There's because I fumbled that uh, at the beginning. Let me read it again. John's disciples told him about all of these things. Calling two of them, he said to them, uh, he, said that he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us uh, to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, you may have two questions. First, what are these things that happened that John has heard about? And second, why is John asking these questions? The first is, is easy. It's, it's just because I didn't read you all of the passages beforehand. Two big stories happen that apparently get back to, uh, get back to John. One is the story of the uh, centurion, a, a Roman soldier. Not, not quite a general, but a, still a pretty high-ranking officer. He's, he's stationed near Capernaum, and, and his servant is sick. Some Jewish leaders approach Jesus and say, you know, this, this Roman centurion, we know he's a Roman, and we know we don't normally associate with them, and, and on and on. But if you can help his servant, he's actually a pretty good guy. He, he helped to build our synagogue. He, he, he's interested in knowing about God. Like, like if, if there's anybody worth helping, surely it's this guy. And Jesus agrees. And he goes to, to meet with the centurion. The centurion sends, a, sends another messenger and again says, oh, I, you know, you're, I, I know your customs mean that you shouldn't come under my roof, and I respect that, uh, but I, I also know that you don't need to. I'm, I'm a person of authority. If I tell one of my servants to do something, they do it. I, I, don't, I don't need to be there. I don't need to see it. I just say an order, and it gets carried out. And Jesus was astonished. He healed his servant from a distance. The servant, the centurion servant, got better. The next story is, is, a, is, is Jesus is, is interrupted. Uh, it's, a, it's a few days later, and Jesus is, is interrupted by a, by a funeral possession, procession. There is, a, there is a widow who is crying over the loss of her son, her only son. And this, this procession, this funeral procession is going through the town. Uh, that means he, he died, people died probably that day. And they're, they're going to go to prepare his body for burial and then bury him uh, later in the day or, or, or the next day. And as Jesus saw this, he, he, he interrupts, he stops this funeral procession and he raises this boy to life. And, and 
and it's a, and an extraordinary act of power. It's, it's an extraordinary act of, of generosity and compassion that Jesus offers because it's easy to miss a detail in there is, is she is a widow who has lost her only son. That means she has neither a, a, a son to take care of her or, or a husband. She is in, a, in, in, a, in her society, she's in a very precarious place. And Jesus brings her son back. And these are major miracles. Uh, you know, bringing someone back from the dead, healing someone, not even laying hands on them, just saying your servant's going to get better, and they get better. And, and, and these stories begin to circulate, and they eventually make it all the way to John. And John hears about them, and instead of reacting with, with faith or excitement, he, he reacts with doubt. And the reason why John is reacting with doubt is because he's in jail. He, he's no longer by the Jordan River baptizing. He's no longer out giving sermons. Uh, he is in jail. Herod and Herodias have thrown him into, into prison. And he has been there now for, for weeks, probably for months. And he's getting the vibe that this is not going well. And I don't think I'm getting out of here. And it's in that prison cell that John's faith begins to, to, uh, begins to wane. It begins to, to shake. He, he feels the weight of it. And he is wondering if Jesus is the person that he thought he was. He's in jail because Herod and Herodias, uh, Herod and Herodias uh, got remarried. To one another. See, John, John is an incredibly passionate guy. We, we don't have a sermon or a speech that he gave about Herod or Herodias, but we do have this one. Uh, John says this. Uh, then John said to the crowds who are coming out to be baptized, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit then in keeping with repentance, and do not say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe lays at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I mean, this is John talking to an audience who is interested in hearing what John has to say. It's, it's a mixture of uh, what, what the Bible calls sinners and tax collectors, as well as religious leaders who have come to, to hear from John. And, and he is, he's pretty pointed with everybody he talks to. He, he, he points to their, their faults, their flaws, their sins, and he tells them to repent, to do better, to correct. And he gives more specific instructions, but, but he is not, he's, he, he's not kind in the way he says it, I guess is the best way to express it. I couldn't imagine starting a sermon and, 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 and pointing my finger at you and yelling, you snakes, who told you to listen to this video? I mean, that's what John is doing. And the religious leaders aren't super impressed with him. They, they, he, he, they find him aggravating, uh, but he seems to be pretty content to stay at the Jordan River, kind of yelling his sermons out, and, and people come out to see him, and then they go home with their lives. So they're not too worried about John and what he says and does. Herod and Herodias, on the other hand, they are either a little more threatened by John or have a little thinner skin than some of the religious leaders. You see... Herodias had been married to Herod's brother. The, the, the Bible, if, you, if you're familiar with the story in the Bible, the, the Bible tends to refer to him as Philip, and Philip is definitely one of his names. If you were to look up this event in history books, he is also called Herod. Uh, Herod, uh, Herod in brackets, uh, the landless, or the one without land. See, Herodias's first husband was supposed to be the Herod who is going to inherit Herod the Great's kingdom. Except he didn't. See, he fell out of favor with the emperor at the time. Herod the Tetrarch, he got married to a, uh, to a, a, a princess. A, a neighboring kingdom, uh, had, uh, they had a political marriage, and they, um, and they were married. For whatever reason, Herod the Tetrarch and Herodias became enamored with one another. 
history, history judges them this way. They say Herodias was probably, um, she was ambitious. Her, her first husband was supposed to become king of Galilee. He did not. She turned her eyes to her brother-in-law, who has become the king of Galilee, and, and opts to leave her husband and marry her brother-in-law. Her brother-in-law has a uh, politically arranged marriage who perhaps he's not overly pleased with or doesn't enjoy their company of. Or perhaps Herodias and daughter are referred to as being quite beautiful. For him, maybe it's an upgrade in beauty. I, I don't know. But whatever it is, he opts to leave his wife and marry his sister-in-law. Now, for John, this is sinful. This is unspeakable. If you read history books about royal families, this stuff is actually pretty commonplace. Not good, not excusing it. It's just most royal uh, families have these kind of quirky moments of, of palace intrigue. But for John, they were going against the very laws of God, the laws that, that Moses had given about why a person could get divorced and why a person could get remarried, uh, whether you should be marrying a kind of a close relative, like, a, like an in-law, and, and Moses had none of it. So for John, he was furious. And again, and again if, if you brood of vipers is the way that he, he addresses the crowd that is coming and is interested in hearing his teaching about God, I can only imagine how he addresses Herod and Herodias. And Herod is having none of it. So he arrests John. He, he throws him into prison. And there he leaves him, not sure what he wants to do with him yet. Herodias wants him executed. Herod probably also wants to execute him, but he is a little more, um, he's a little more unsure because enough people in his kingdom think of John as a prophet that he doesn't want to make life difficult for himself. So it's in those moments, those moments where John is locked in a prison cell, where he is, is stuck in a fortress, a prison in the middle of the desert, in the sweltering heat, with little food and little to drink, feeling like he has done everything that he was supposed to do. He begins to think of his cousin Jesus, the, the person whom he baptized, the person whom he saw uh, a, a dove from heaven come down, the, the person he saw that something within his soul, within his, within his very inner being, cried out to say that this is the Messiah. Somewhere in that cell, John began to doubt. So he sent messengers and asked Jesus, Hey, cousin, I said you were the Messiah, but am I wrong? I mean, what he's really saying is, I'm locked up in here, and I thought I was doing the work that God wanted me to do, and, and here I am locked up. Was I wrong? Are you not the guy that I thought you were? Underneath that question is a, an assumption, and that assumption is, if you're the guy I thought you were, if, if you are the Messiah, if you are here to right the wrongs of the world, and, and I'm your cousin, and I'm, your, like, I'm, your, I'm like your hype man, I'm like your spokesman, I, 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 I've been pointing people in your direction, and if I'm still locked up in here, if you haven't done anything to help me, was I wrong? Are you not the person that I think you are. So John sent two servants to ask him that. And they find Jesus in Capernaum. Now just to make sure I paint the right picture for Capernaum for you. Capernaum is on the Sea of Galilee. It's gorgeous. It's, it's temperate. It's lush. It's it's like a seaside Mediterranean vacation. It is exactly the place that you want to go when you think about traveling to anywhere in the Mediterranean. It's, it's those warm uh, uh, days and nice nights and good food 
uh, I mean, Jesus is in a, in a gorgeous area. And John is in a prison cell in a desert. So, John, so Jesus responds this way. What he tells John's messenger is, is this. John, uh, Jesus asks John to look at the things that Jesus are doing and compare them to the expectations of who the Messiah is. Jesus says, uh, at, at that time, or Luke tells us this, at, at, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So Jesus replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus is ultimately saying, John, I know you're questioning me. You're, you're wondering if you're wrong, and I'm telling you you're not. And here is how you can confirm it. I, I need you to look at what the, the expectations are for what the Messiah is going to do, and I need you to compare it to what I actually am doing. And then you'll see, you weren't wrong. I am the Messiah. But what do we want to do with this, this story? I will say that this is one of those narratives in, in the Bible that I, I really wish went on a little further. Because John's disciples leave and, and presumably go back and, and tell John what Jesus says, but we never hear that side of the conversation. Jesus says a little bit more about John. He, he praises him for being such a great guy, and, uh, and then he talks a bit about the kingdom of heaven. But, but we, we don't get a, a, a view for how John receives this information. As Jesus sent this word back, this, this response to John's question, was John comforted? Was he empowered? Did he feel a sense of peace? Did he look at these words or did he hear these words and he goes, yeah, yeah, that, I mean, I, that's in Isaiah. I mean, that's, I guess that's what the Messiah is supposed to do. I mean, did he react that way? Was he angry? Did he hear these words and go, well, what good is that for me? Did he look at these words and feel a sense of sorrow? Because underneath the words, underneath John's question to Jesus, wasn't just, are you the Messiah, but was also, and aren't you going to help me out? And Jesus also sort of said, no, at least a soft no. And, and John doesn't leave his jail cell to, to resume his life. He, he does ultimately die in that prison. And I don't know how John received it. And I think, I think that's not entirely the point. That The point is probably how do we receive that as an answer. See, Luke, I think, is curious how, how you and I are going to respond to Jesus saying, I am who I am. I am the Messiah. I, I am. Even if your life is going a bit difficult right now. John was looking at what was happening to him. And he was saying, my experiences, are they telling me something about the nature of God? Are, are, is my current experience, as I'm sitting here in this jail cell, telling me that God doesn't really care about me, doesn't really love me, or worse, that God doesn't really care about anyone? Or maybe I'm being punished for something I, I, I failed to do. Is, is, this, is this God's... A judgment on my life. And again, I think those are really natural responses. Jesus' response to John asks John to look further and take a bit of a broader view. He wants him to look beyond this one point, albeit very significant and very painful part of his life, and not use this to try to extrapolate to see what God is up to. But instead, Jesus is asking John to look at Jesus' life, the work that he is doing to help him understand who God is and what God is up to. The things that are happening to John tell us an awful lot about how the world works, more so than it tells us about the nature of God. See, John is in jail 
Because two powerful people with very thin skins who are worried about their political power decided to use their political power to, uh, to, to cast violence onto John because he said something that they didn't like. And that is kind of the way our world works. That even if you do everything right, the people around you may not. The people around you may make choices that have consequences on your life. You can do nothing wrong. You can rub someone the wrong way or someone's choice that they make, again, negatively impacts you. God allowed his creation to have a great deal of freedom. That freedom is, is the price we pay to be able to love God freely. And as you reflect on your life right now, as you think about the, the hopes and dreams that you had for the, fi- the previous year and the hopes and dreams that you have for this year, if you have that sense of feeling of being stuck or worried that this year may not be the year either, if you, you risk falling into that same headspace that John fell into, you might begin to think that because your job isn't really working out right now or your relational dreams that, that they aren't quite clicking together, or, or whatever it is that you hoped and dreamed for, uh, whatever it is that you're carrying that, that may not come to pass, you, you may begin to wonder if God really does care about you, if he, if he really does love you. And the answer that Jesus gave to John is the answer I think he gives to you and I as well. He says, I, I know that you're in a tough spot right now, but what I need you to do is to look at my life. Look at all the things I've done and said. Look at the actions I've taken. And from our perspective, looking that Garis gave his life and came back, if you really want to know how God moves in this world, what God thinks of you individually or, or us collectively, then Jesus invites us to look at his life and extrapolate from that to know that your Father in heaven cares deeply for you. As to why your specific dream or your specific goal may not be coming together right now, either last year or this year, I don't know. I mean, without really sitting down with you and really hashing it out and talking it through about why this specific goal isn't coming together, I can't answer that. But If you, like John, are sure that you've done everything right, don't allow your right actions and right desires to be dashed against the rocks of a wrong world, causing you to lose your right faith. Or as Jesus put it, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Let me pray for you. Well, gracious God, we just thank you for today. You, you know that, that we are entering this, this point in the year with, with some level of hope and expectation, but, but we don't know what's in front of us. You know, we, we, we hope for, for good, we hope for better, but, but we don't know. Help us to trust you even when things are difficult, even when our, our, our greatest hopes and our greatest desires don't seem like they're coming true. May we trust you in those moments. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to offer you a benediction, and then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you my same kind of uh, send you on your way line. But I do want to remind you that after I do that, uh, we tend to show a couple of announcements. And then, of course, we have, uh, we have kids' church. Uh, so if you have kids in the house, you can, you can bring them towards the, the video now. Um, or, or if you've been sitting very patiently, hi, guys, then, um, then, it, then what's really for you is, about to, is really about to come. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Uh, Go in peace. We'll see you uh, next week. Uh, Same Baptist time, same Baptist channel. Amen.